right, good morning. It's good to be back. It feels like it's been a few weeks. Just get a good look at you for a second. I miss you when I don't get this moment with you. I, I, I'm, I'm nervous. Today I feel a little bit like I've been in a car accident. Um, I took a racquetball to this eye, if you're wondering. Uh, it wasn't Tanya, uh, but it broke my glasses and uh, knocked me pretty good. And then yesterday, uh, Friday night, I was walking out, <laughs> right out, I was walking out to have a little campfire and uh, um, hit a patch of black ice over at our family cabin in the driveway. And just picture me horizontal, about four feet in the air. And, and there's just no good way to land that. In Olympic terms, I did not stick the landing. Um, I did not qualify for the medal round. I just laughed at myself and ached. So I kind of feel like I'm uh, need a steady... A regimen of ibuprofen right now, but it's good to be with you. This is the life of a pastor the week before he talks about loving genuinely. Our sixth rhythm, our New Testament practice, the way of Jesus is to love genuinely. You ever had a hard time loving someone? Come on, real talk this morning, people. I know you're in church, but don't lie. You ever felt deeply disappointed in someone? Just kind of, you can nod at me. Yeah. You ever felt betrayed by someone's gossip? Forgotten by a friend? Frustrated by a family member? Rejected for a reason that you didn't understand? If you've ever felt disappointed in a friend, a relative, uh, an elected official, just keep moving, Jim, keep moving. Um, a neighbor that you're praying will want to move soon, anywhere, just move away. Just give me a nod if you've uh, ever wrestled with unforgiveness and bitterness, resentment, come on, uh, anger, contempt, contempt, What's contempt? Contempt is the definition of contempt. It's the feeling that a person or a thing is beneath your consideration, is worthless, or deserving scorn. We're now living in a culture that's swimming in a tsunami of contempt. It's everywhere and anywhere. It's even in church. Can you think of someone right now that in your heart, if you were to be really honest, you wrestle with feeling contempt for them? Can I just say, I can't stand them either. But that's not what you need from your pastor. Is anybody waiting for an apology from someone? (laughs) Just nod at me. It'd really be nice to get an apology. And that apology isn't coming. What if you could be free from that ache, free free to courageously care without fear of being hurt, without fear of being forgotten or disrespected or disregarded? What if there was a way for you to live free from the contamination of contempt? And so we pray. Pray with me. Lord, today we seek your kingdom first. May our heart find refuge in your presence. May our relationships flourish in your peace. And may our lives find joy in your perspective. As your kingdom comes to us now, may it arrive through us this week. As we put your word into practice, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you allow me to speak the word of God for you, just over you? Here's a tough thing. I'm going to talk about loving genuinely. Here's the challenge as a teacher. The New Testament references loving over 200 times. I have written no fewer than seven or eight messages that were all about an hour long. Fortunately, we've gotten it down to this, but I cannot escape these passages. At first, I think I was just going to read the Bible for like 30 minutes. But I think this will suffice. 
200 times in the New Testament, Scripture tells us the answer to contempt is connecting to God's love, to emulate, to impersonate, to replicate, to imitate God's love for us in the same way that Jesus loved us sacrificially and unconditionally. I give you the word of God. Ephesians 3.17 calls us to have our lives to be rooted and grounded in what? In love. 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love, which springs from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. If so, answer, I do. We're called to be married to this idea of love, and yet it seems so foreign in a culture of contempt. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, loved people, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love. We sang it. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected, matured, grown up in love. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 8, love each other deeply since love covers a multitude of sins. Colossians 3.14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. John 13, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if, if, if you have love for one another. Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Matthew 22, and Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 6.35, passage I wish wasn't in the Bible, Jesus said, but love your enemies. Do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Okay. Romans 12, 9. We had a few more left. Let love be genuine. I'm not going to read all 200. Just about 25. Let love be genuine. There's our rhythm. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John 3.18. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. There's our rhythm. Romans 8, 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Jesus, our Lord. This is where it comes from. The love of God in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, a few more. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
1 John 3, 16. By this we know that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. By this we know love. By this we know love. If we love one another, 1 John 4, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. 1 Peter 1, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Romans 5, 5, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 2 Corinthians 5, and there's four more. For the love of Christ controls, constrains, and compels us. James 2.8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. John 3.16, and don't forget verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow, let me read it to you out of the New Living. I'll give you a few translations. Let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. Some translations say, let love follow the way of love. Pursue love. Earnestly pursue love. Love should be your guide. Be eager in pursuing love. Make love your aim. The Amplified says, pursue this love with eagerness. Make it your goal. I offer you the new living. Let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. I, I, when, I'm, when I get some time over at our family cabin, I like to shoot my bow. I'm not very good at it, but I like shooting it. Part of what I like shooting about it is I don't just shoot it into the air. Um, that's what we call being 15. Um, I like shooting at a target. Yeah, that did happen. Um, I have a goal now. I have a target, and this is my target. I put it out by a tree. Many of you know my dog, uh, Rui. I'll put a picture of him up on the screen for you. Um, Yeah, he goes out there, and he just stands there by the target, and it's, it's motivation for me to shoot for the bullseye. No, I don't shoot while he's sitting there. But this is, this is actually my target. And, and the bullseye right there, that's my goal. But who can see, I don't hit the bullseye very often. And I, I come to you as a student of love, not as an expert. I, I, when it comes to love, my target probably looks even worse than that. <laughs> but I have a goal. Paul says, let love be your highest goal. And can I just pastorally say to you that as a people, as a faith community, as followers of Jesus, this for us is love. And making it anything else is anti-kingdom, anti-Christ, pharisaical, and gutless. Real courage as a disciple of Jesus means pointing your entire life right here. And Paul says that is love. And it takes courage. It takes the the spirit of God. It takes the love that we know being the love that we show. And if you say, Jim, I I have no love to show for anybody right now. (laughs) I, I get it. But can we go get it? Because whoever you're following, (laughs) I want to follow Jesus. And I cannot divorce our method with God's message. (laughs) Can't. 
But the goal of our instruction, Paul told Timothy, the goal, Timothy, of pastoring Ephesus is love. 1 Timothy 1.5. But the goal of our instruction is love. So whatever questions followers of Jesus are now asking in the face of the challenges of our day, I'm suggesting that love must be central if our answers are to be consistent with the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus. So what happens if the gospel's aim veers away from the aim or the rhythm of genuine love? What happens if the gospel's aim veers away from the aim of genuine love? What happens if we allow contempt to replace compassion at the heart of the gospel? Well, we've removed the good news from the gospel and have made it no gospel at all. To take God's sacrificial and undeserved love for us out of the gospel and to replace it with anything, let alone our judgment of others, would be sin. It would be sin. Sin simply means missing the mark. Not so much yellow, more red, blue, black, white, or somewhere backstage. <laughs> That's sin. This one right here, sin. This one here went astray. This one here went astray. This is an archery term that literally means to miss the mark. To take God's sacrificial and undeserved love for us out of the gospel and to replace it with anything, let alone our judgment of others, would be sin Simply put, sin, missing the mark. And you don't want to miss the mark. The church makes genuine love a top seven rhythm or the church will go astray. The mission will miss the mark. It's no doubt with a, a loveless church will fall into hypocrisy, modern day Pharisee, Pharisaic fallacy, a falsehood, and eventually heresy. Love is that central to the gospel. <laughs> Could you imagine if God sent Jesus to approve of everyone that was right? Who'd like to go to that church? Uh, there'd be nobody in it. <laughs> but yet we come and we recognize not just the cross on a wall or the cross on this stage or the cross around your neck. We recognize that the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the spirit of Christ that raised Jesus from the dead. This is our message. And love is the aim of our method. <sighs> So what is love? For, it's written in Galatians 5, 6. Only faith activated and expressed and working through love means anything. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just reading the Bible to you. It means anything. So let's reestablish what God's love is and what it is not. Because it's very different than you might think. The New Testament was written originally in what language? Greek, right? And the word used 200 times in the New Testament is the word agape. That is the Greek word for God's love. God's love is unconditional. Please hear me when I say this. Unconditional doesn't mean that God loves everything that we do. <laughs> God is love and... God's love doesn't place a condition on you to earn it before he loves you. Somebody say amen. <laughs> really? I thought the church was just a bunch of people that were trying to be good enough for God. Might be true, but let's get set free. Because that, that is not the message of the cross. 
God doesn't place a condition on you to earn his love. He is already a God who is love, and he doesn't decide when he gets a good look at you. Hmm. Yeah, I love him. Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday, eh. God loves you because he is love, not because somehow we found a way to earn it. The word agape love means, and I'll give you a few definitions, three to be exact, and, and the fourth is what it's not. Love is the will, is to will the good of others. Love is to will the good of others. Another definition is love is to promote the good, to want the good for human lives that are within your range of influence. To promote the good of human lives that are within the range of one's influence. This is agape love. To love something or someone is when we promote its good for its own sake. Who? And lastly, love is not desire. Love is not desire. Dallas Willard says, we say, I love chocolate cake, but we really want to eat it. That's desire. Nothing wrong with desire, it's just not agape love. Desire is enjoying something. It's appreciating something, right? I love that painting. I appreciate it. It's, it's a pro- desire is approving of something. I, 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 I love how Brock plays drums. It's it's approving, but doesn't mean I have love necessarily for Brock unless I'm willing the good for him. They're different things. There's nothing wrong with approving of something or someone. Another definition I hear of love a lot is condoning. I, I... I just love the way that person, you're, you're condoning what they're doing. You're approving, appreciating, enjoying. You desire that person. But love, God's love, is to will the good of others for their own sake without expecting anything in return. Whew. That's what we're here to learn to do. That's what Paul t- said to Timothy. Timothy, that's what we're here to learn to do. This is what it looks like to imitate God. And when I read this, uh, what I'm about to read you, this was really helpful for me in understanding what God wanted for me and hopefully for you too. God doesn't want me to go through the day trying to feel loving. Listen, because here's some of the soundest words philosophically on the subject of God's love and how we are to become imitators, apprentices, disciples of Jesus in emulating that love. These words are from uh, Dallas Willard. Paul understood the fallacy of those who say, I just can't love so-and-so. And there they stop and they give up on love. You ever been there? He knew that they were working at the wrong level. They should not try to love that person, but try to become the kind of person who would love them. rut row. <laughs> He's going to get to the heart of the matter, and this is who we want to become. Only so, only so can the ideal of love pass into a real possibility and practice. Our aim under love is not to be loving to this or that person or in this or that kind of situation, but to be a person possessed by love as an overall character of life, whatever is or is not going on. The occasions are met with from that overall character. I do not come to my enemy and then try to love them. I come to them as a loving person. Love is not a faucet to be turned on or off at will. God himself doesn't just love me or you. He is love. He is creative will for all that is good. That's his identity and explains why he loves individuals even when he is not pleased with them. We are directed by Paul to be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. We do not achieve the disposition of agape love by direct effort, but by attending to and putting into place the conditions out of which it arises. 
If we take care of the sources of our actions, he concludes, actions will take care of themselves. <sighs> Can I just share some of the problems that I'm guessing you may have with loving people because I've experienced them all myself too. Problem number one, does God really expect me to feel loving towards someone I don't agree with? <laughs> Does God want, number two, does God want me to feel loving towards someone that has brought harm to me or someone I care about? Number three, does God want me to like or enjoy or God forbid desire good for someone who I find unethical, immoral, or abusive? I just can't bring myself to that. And we find our hearts struggling with those questions and divorcing ourselves, wanting to believe the message but choosing a different method. Am I supposed to feel loving towards someone that I can't even find it in my heart to forgive? Ooh, now we're having church. If we are going to establish the rhythm of loving genuinely, these are the things we have to be honest about. And here's the good news, is the answer to all four of those questions is no. God doesn't expect you to feel loving because love isn't a feeling. To God, love isn't a feeling, it's a fact. It's a condition of his character. It's the posture of his nature. And God wants us to join him in making it the condition of our new life in Christ. We don't try to feel loving. We put on love. We wear it. Because it's the coat of our Father. And it's the cross of our Christ. We don't love people to set them free from their irresponsible behavior. We love people because it sets us free to be like our Savior. The Spirit of Christ has a goal in your heart and life. I'll be frank about it. He's longing to dislodge contempt and unforgiveness from your heart toward any and all and replace it with his love and forgiveness at the core of who you are. Replacing contempt with love. First, towards yourself. Second, towards others. Ultimately, towards God. Anything less is sin. It's going astray. It's missing the point. It's missing the mark of God's best for you to live and to flourish in God's favor. Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. Grace is God's unmerited favor for you. And peace is God's call to human flourishing for all that God has for you, it's here but it goes hand in hand with removing contempt from our hearts and receiving the compassion of the cross and then deciding that the way of Jesus will be the way we will follow. How are we doing being the kind of person who would love our neighbor? Well, it depends. Who's the neighbor I'm supposed to love? <laughs> the Pharisees asked Jesus the same question. Well, what do you mean by neighbor? Told him a story. Jesus picked the most hated person they could think of. You fill in the blank. He picked the Samaritan. It was a nearby ethnic group that Jews believed had contaminated their Jewish faith and, well, with their immoral and unethical practices and the Samaritans were the butt end of all of their scorn and contempt and he picked the Samaritan to be the good Samaritan who loved 
his neighbor properly. Thanks, Jesus. Who's the Samaritan for us? People we don't prefer, people we struggle to forgive, people we disagree with, what they stand for, people we believe are getting it deeply and profoundly wrong. People who have cursed us, people who have despitefully used us. (laughs) Jim, are, are you kidding me? This is what Jesus wants from me? Guys, let me read it to you from his words, Matthew 5, 43. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? We're commanded to love people. And here's the difference between God's love and man's love. God's love is about what he wants for you. Man's love is often what he wants from you. And this is the example that we have. But that's what he wants for people who have their act together, right? No. No. That's what he wants for people to help them get their act together. God's love is about grace and peace. Man's love is about gain and pleasure. This is what Jesus taught. This is... This is how the New Testament church believed in agape love. This is how the church was being led by Jesus, Paul, Peter, James, John. 200 verses. And yet I have to warn us that there is a gospel of contempt that's being preached that isn't storming the gates of hell. It's actually ushering people right in. The name Satan means the accuser. And the spirit of the accuser loves him some contempt. And when it comes to contempt, hell is full of it, but the kingdom of heaven will have none of it. Kingdom come, thy will be done. When it comes to contempt, you say, yeah, pastor, I hate people that are hateful. (laughs) no not the answer I do too I do not need Jesus to do that I just have contempt for the contemptuous welcome to the first church of the Pharisee a crossless gospel is no gospel at all We are to will God's best for even our enemies and those who would curse us or use us. You might say, Jim, I don't feel like it. Me neither. But here's the thing. The only way out of anger and unforgiveness and contempt is love. To love is counterintuitive to our nature that's bent on desire. We have to be born again. To want what is best for others rather than demanding what's best from others is unnatural to our selfish nature. And I see way too many Christians being way too easy on their selfish nature and not carrying this. Me too. Me too. I I, I miss the bullseye a lot. And yet I still want this to be a rhythm of our lives. If love is counterintuitive, can I just suggest that contempt is counterproductive? If there was a way that was better than love, if there was a God that was better than this, I would offer him to you. But there isn't, is there? I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
child of God. And I want this working in my life. I want the power of the cross, not the power of contempt. Jim, I can't love someone who's hurt me or others I love. I can't love wrong. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say that? I get it though. Well, love doesn't condone injustice or abuse. True. Willing the good, willing God's best. Well, for a drunk person, isn't to throw them the keys. Sometimes love stands squarely in the way of what someone wants because you love them. Christ's love may require you caring enough about people in some situations to not give them what they want. Good is not drunk driving. Good is possibly sobriety or intervention or law enforcement or treatment. Or if you love that person, you don't let them drive. See what I'm saying? But sometimes we're so quick to, to give our hearts license for contempt because we think love is unjust and untrue and disingenuous. Not the love of the cross. No sin, no need for this. The point and power of agape love is that it actively, compassionately, and sacrificially makes us the kind of people who are ready and willing to act for the good of any who call Jesus Lord. All who come into contact with us, whether we personally benefit from them or whether they satisfy a selfish desire in us or not, we will the good. We will God's best. Well, what if it's not what they want? Well, we're gonna have to love our enemy. Would a loving God wanted what was best for you, did any of you wonder if the cross made Jesus look soft on sin? Well, you know, we just, if we love people that are doing wrong stuff, they're gonna think they can get away with it. Is that what that says to you? When Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said, Father, forgive them, that assumes fault. Something needed to be forgiven. For they know not what they do. Does anyone look at the cross and wonder where Jesus stood on sin because he stood with sinners like us? You know what love looks like? And Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself daily. Take up his cross and follow me. We can't quit preaching that. You know what our goal is gonna be? My last shot on Saturday before I came home, I hit the bullseye. <laughs> I, I, let me show you a picture. I gotta have proof. <laughs> I, I, am not, I will not be shooting a bow and arrow in church this morning, but I was so shocked that I got it right one time. I mean, you can see I'm all over the map. And I just stopped and I, I, pulled, them, I pulled all the other arrows out because I didn't want you to see them. Um, I just wanted you to see the one time I got it right. And I, I think we can look for each other getting it right. We, we had this thing called the CARE movement a uh, year and a half ago. We just encouraged each other to dare to care. It's, it's on the one, one of the sides of your, your handout. Share your story with us. Dare to care again. We need it more than ever. And on the flip side, I've asked you to reach one 
for Jesus this year, you're gonna do it with the method of the cross because that's the message of the cross. There's a code at the bottom that if you would bring someone through Rooted, put that in as your promo code, you can bring through someone through for free. It means that much to us that you would make love your aim, make it your goal. Bring someone through Rooted and watch God use you in just willing the good for someone else spiritually, relationally, personally. Bow your heads with me for a moment. I wanna pray as we go. Three prayers to begin the rhythm of loving genuinely in our lives. The first prayer is this. God, pour out your love into my heart. Right? I can't do it on my own. Romans 5.5, 5, but God's love has been poured into our hearts. Would, would you just maybe even just open your hands in front of you and just say, Lord, by your spirit, pour out your love into my heart. I know that the love that I know will be the love that I'll show. But without knowing your love, what, what do I have to give? God, pour out your love into our hearts. And Lord, as you do, remove contempt and make me a person of love. Lord, remove contempt. Lord, I check my heart right now. If there's anyone in my spirit that I'm just, I think is not worth loving, not worth, God, your sacrifice for them, Lord, I begin by removing contempt from my speech. And Lord, remove it from my heart. Lord, I want to be an imitator of God like Paul taught. Lord, let my love for others look like your love for me. And lastly, Lord, I choose your love to be my life's aim. Lord, I, you don't love me because I'm right. You don't love me because I deserve it. Lord, you love me because you are love. I receive that love. Would you just pray that? I receive it. I repent of contempt. Remove it from my heart. And Jesus, I choose your love to be my life's aim. Amen. I close with this thought. Oftentimes, one of the reasons we're afraid to love is because we know that we're not going to receive it in return. Like, oh, there's no point in loving that person because that's not, you know. There's no reciprocal desire there. That's man's love. This week, I want you to think of the cross when you think that my job isn't to see whether someone is meeting a condition but I'm going to imitate the unconditional love of God towards anyone that's within my reach. Because God reached out for me, making it not an emotional thing, but an act of our will to look like Jesus. Amen? Would you stand with me? Thank you for letting me challenge you. <laughs> I'm challenged. And our bullseye is gonna look a little bit like this this week. But I pray that when you hit the bullseye, you would receive all of the joy of obedience and we'd keep aiming together at a life of loving genuinely. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you, give you peace. In Jesus' name, God bless you this week.